All right, thank you everyone. Uh, just before I start, I just wanted to acknowledge that this is a collaboration involving many people and many institutions. Um, and you've seen many of these icons already, logos, but just pointing out that um, the, the foremost part of the research I'm presenting is being done at the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies and in collaboration with Ames. And so a big shout out there to Vanessa Mesmer and Jason Doyle who have been doing some of the genetics I'm going to present. And then just point out that we've received funding for this from Lizard Island, the RRRC, the Morris Family Foundation, and also the Ness Tropical Water Quality Hub. So what I'm doing today is just giving you a really brief snapshot of some of the research we've been doing. And it's been largely driven by people like Dave saying, these are the pertinent questions we need answers on as fast as possible. Um, and so, one of the things we're confronted as researchers all the time is that, you know, I'm not unique, but a lot, I've spent the last 25 years working on crown of thorns, and when you say that to someone, they come back with you, well, surely you know it all, or anything you don't know, you can't possibly know. So we're always, you know, having to push back on that and point out that there's a lot of very pertinent questions which we do have the technology to address. And much of the research, when we look at this basic life cycle of a crown of thorns starfish, has been going on in the benthic, or, the, or the, the life history phase in which the crown of thorns are already on the reef. And mostly when we're talking about adults, we know a lot about their behaviour. For example, in the 80s and 90s, we worked out what their feeding preferences were, we worked out their reproductive um, behaviour and things like that. There is, however, some really important components of this life cycle for which we know almost nothing. Uh, primarily what's happening during this larval development period, and most critically what happens at this transition between the pelagic and benthic life stage, when the cots actually settle. So this, is, this photo in the top right is a photo of a tiny little crown of thorn starfish taken by Jennifer Wilms sitting down there, um, showing that we can now find these newly settled crown of thorns on the reef and it's providing phenomenal insights into what's happening during this life stage. But we still are faced with these critical knowledge gaps and you can talk about this as a glass half full or glass empty. What I did recently was go back and look at a very seminal review paper written by Peter Moran exactly 30 years ago who listed 41 research questions which he considered were absolutely critical to advancing understanding and management of crown of thorn starfish. Now out of those 41 questions in the last 30 years we've managed to answer just over half of them. Um, and most of those answered questions shown here in blue relate to the adult behaviour and biology. When we look at things like settlement and juveniles, we're doing a pretty poor job. A lot of the unanswered questions considered critical to understanding and managing crown of thorns have not been in any way addressed in the last 30 years. And partly that was because we just didn't have a mechanism or a method that was useful to address some of these questions. So what are the questions? Well, I'm just going to focus on three of them for this talk, um, which were largely unresolved. The first one is, where do larvae settle? So you can understand that for nearly any other coral reef organism, we have phenomenal information about the settlement pattern, in the timing and also the particular microhabitat and <coughs> habitat preferences. We didn't have that information for crown of thorn starfish. The other thing which is sort of related to that is once they have settled is how far do the juveniles actually move. So when you locate an aggregation of crown of thorns, which is the focus of the management, is that disparate or completely discontinuous from where they actually settled or is it one in the same location? And that's a critically important thing in terms of understanding how we improve management food moving forward. But also in terms of the movement question, there's also the sort of bigger question about how far can adults move and most critically, can they actually move between reefs? So these are some of the questions we've been trying to tackle of late. Um, and for the, for the overall review of you know, how we're tracking in terms of all those questions, we published that as a retrospective in this special issue which was edited by myself and Sven Uthiki from a Okay, so firstly, how do we measure settlement? So 
Way back in the early 90s, John Keesing actually came up with a, with a model system for measuring settlement which worked for echinoderms and basically involved taking these bioballs, which are product from aquaculture, just by virtue of the fact they've got really high surface area, and paid, placing them in a plastic bag and attaching that to the reef. We've modified it slightly. We're now putting them in leaf collectors from down pipes, which are much more robust. We put two of those together, sandwich them together, and there's about 70 bioballs inside of them. And we deploy them with a stainless steel cable, which is attached to the reef. We put them out in around November and collect them after the spawning period, which in, on the Great Barrier Reef is December, January. We first did this with funding from RRRC. And what we had to do was actually search through all the material that we washed out of those bioballs and it was incredibly time consuming and arduous process. So here you see two of my research assistants searching under the microscope for these tiny little newly settled crown of thorns which are essentially the size of a pinhead and we actually removed up to half a kilo of material out of those settlement collectors so it was a fairly arduous process. So that was three years ago. We now can um, announced that we have a genetic probe that is essentially working which was developed by Vanessa and Jason Doyle where they can go through, take a subsample of the material from these settlement collectors and just see whether we've got a hit for crown of thorns or not. So here's our positive control, this white bar here. So anywhere where you're seeing that white bar on these PCR plates is showing that we have a positive hit for crown of thorns. Um, and we've done the relevant dosing experiments to try and work out our detectability and at this stage it's just a presence absence test. We are working on a quantitative PCR method which will allow us to say how many potentially larvae are settling into those traps. But the data I'm going to present here is just based on the proportion of traps which actually had larvae settling into them. Now the most critical question we were, faced, were you know, really trying to ask, answer was whether there was a depth preference in settlement patterns. So there's a paper, a fairly influential paper written by Craig Johnson suggesting that cots generally will settle in very deep water and then walk up the reef. So the first thing we did was deploy these settlement collectors on a given reef. Mostly it was moor, rib reef and lodestone. We put them in the shallows and the mid depths and relatively deep given the constraints of our <coughs> H&S diving. And you can see that we didn't really get a really clear trend. All this graph here is showing the total number of traps. So we got higher returns in the deeper water than in the shallows because they're less subject to things like tropical storms. But down here is the proportion of the traps which had a positive hit for those cots DNA which suggests we had settlement in these and there wasn't a clear pattern. So what I can conclude from this is that we definitely have cots settling in shallow water but also in deep water. Okay, so the other part of this, and I'll come back to some of those conclusions in a minute, um, is looking at movement. And we're doing this in two ways. One is we just place a crown of thorns in a tank and see how fast it can traverse across the tank. And then we also tag cots. And you can see this is just chucking a piece of flagging tape on their spines. So it's a very short duration tagging method, but it's proving very effective. So in terms of the movement in a tank, all we're doing is trying to work out what is the maximum rate of movement they can attain over different substrates. So we had sand, pavers, which is supposed to be equivalent of consolidated carbonate or reef, and also complex rubble. And you can see that the starfish move faster over sand, these white dots, than they do over the pavers, and then they move more slowly over the rubble. The other thing is, is that there's a very strong size effect here, where larger starfish can move faster. Now when we turn this into how far they can move in a day, an average size starfish between 30 and 40 centimetres can move 500 metres a day across sand, uh, about 400 metres across the reef and 300 metres across rubble. Okay? So we work that out and look at the maps like this to say, well, can they move between reefs? So here, these arrows are colour coded according to these time frames down here. So a big starfish could move that distance there in about two weeks. If it was to move all the way down to here, it would take it well over half a year. Okay? Now that almost doubles when we're talking about a smaller starfish. So they could do it, but it's going to take them weeks to months, if not years.
But the other thing we have to point out is that we never see starfish just running around like that, okay? When we actually look at the activity budgets of crown of thorns, they spend very little of their time actually moving. Now this might be because they've got access to prey, so the minute they come across a coral, they stop and feed. It might be very different out over, over open sand. But we do think that they're energetically constrained, and usually when you starve a starfish, it just won't move at all. Okay, so we think the prospect of moving between reefs is pretty low. Now on this, what we're showing is during the day, the proportion of time moving is very, very low. Most of their time is just at rest, not feeding, not moving. Whereas during the night, they generally do move a little bit more, but most of the time is feeding rather than resting. Okay, so based on those field-based tagging experiments, how far does a crown of thorns actually move? Now, because we're using a short duration tag at this stage, the maximum amount of time we followed a crown of thorns for is only four days. But the results so far are really, really interesting in the sense that this here is the minimum displacement distance. So the, the shortest linear distance between where we found a starfish over two consecutive periods, okay? And so we're going back in the water up to four times a day and mapping the individual position of these crown of forms. And over this entire period, the, there's a question mark about what happens at more than 10 metres because it could just be a detectability issue. So some of the starfish might just move so far that we never find them again. But a very large proportion, our detectability rates here are upwards of 80%, are staying within a very small area. And most of the starfish will move one metre from where they rest, at, rest during the day to where they feed at night and back again. And a very large proportion of these starfish are found in exactly the same sheltering position day after day after day. So they have very high site fidelity as long as there is food around. Okay, so in conclusion, in terms of the settlement um, experiments, we can say pretty conclusively from the settlement collectors so far that crown of thorn starfish do settle in shallow reef environments. Until we have the quantitative estimates of the number of larvae in those caves, we can't say whether there's any more or less settlement in shallow water, but they will settle in those shallow reef environments. And there's still a lot more work to do to ascertain what the specific settlement cues and habitat preferences for those larvae are. The important thing from my perspective, however, is that these settlement traps are going to provide an unprecedented opportunity to actually go out there and look in much more detail at these settlement patterns, to understand things like stock recruitment relationships, which have been critically important for managing a lot of other pests um, and, and other reef organisms. Um, it'll also be crucial in understanding what's happening in terms of um, the effects of things like nutrients and overfishing on this stage of the life cycle. In terms of the movement, um, I, and we've already seen the, the manifestation of some of these results in some of the models where, where um, Cameron and David have already sort of made this conclusion in some of their analyses, but the adult crown of thorn starfish do exhibit very high site fidelity. When you go back to the same site and find a big crown of thorns, it's probably because you missed it the first time. It's unlikely it's because it's moved in necessarily from somewhere else. Um, the caveat on that is once coral cover, and especially acropora coral cover, gets below a certain level, they do start to exhibit this directional movement down the reef. But while they're still acropora around, they tend to stay put. Um, the rates of movement are highly constrained. And that's especially true for the really small starfish and also in complex reef habitat. So the take home message from that is, for me is that the potential for large scale movements and these inter-reef inter migrations appears very limited. And what that says is that we need to understand these settlement patterns. If you're gonna predict where to find lots of crown of thorns and how to effectively manage them, you need to know where they're settling. Thanks very much.